Hello, it's Amy, and I'm back again with part two, uh, the second volume in the A. Edward Newton collection of books and manuscripts. And this is the auction catalog uh, detailing all the parts of A. Edward Newton's library that were sold at auction in New York in 1941 after his death. And you might recall that I filmed a couple of videos on these volumes uh, earlier in the month. And I'm back again here with part two. And I think I mentioned in a previous video that all of these parts have their own introductions. And so the introduction to this volume is written by William Holland Winterbroad, or Winterroad, who was a friend of Newton's and he was apparently the vice president of the Baldwin Locomotive Works. Uh, hence this very interesting little device here uh, with the initials WHW, uh, Newton's name, uh, made into the shape of a train. And this introduction begins with a quote from Robert Louis Stevenson. Come, said I to my engine. <laughs> And he's got some very nice sentiments about trains to describe uh, just how difficult it is to speak about his beloved lost friend. To maintain one's balance on the deck of a rolling locomotive, face the furious heat the open fire door exhales, squint into the blinding flame and hit the low spots with coal slid from a swinging scoop is easy. To twist a six inch brake valve handle and bring a 100 car train from 50 miles an hour to a stop at a prescribed place is simple. To pilot a deep-throated siren out of the rails through the night, her finger of light picking out the glistening ribbons that form her path, the red and green signal lights blinking their messages of danger and safety, is not difficult. To plan the various parts of a leviathan of the rails, control the fabrication and assembly of material, and supervise its erection into a living giant, is fun. But to phrase an expression that will truly indicate the depth of my feeling for my beloved friend, A. Edward Newton, is impossible. There are individual feelings that cannot be communicated in words. True friendship is a matter of the heart. Lives there a man who has not, in moments of serious reflection, pondered the inexplicable chain of circumstances that led to a seemingly unimportant personal experience, which passing years proved to be of, major, of a major moment in his life? Twenty-two years ago, recuperating from a serious illness, my weak and trembling fingers turned the pages of A. Edward Newton's The Amenities of Book Collecting for the first time. Little did I dream that eventually the incident would make me a book collector, lead me to a broader and richer life, bring me a beloved friend, and give me the inestimable privilege of expressing myself in this catalogue. Seldom are we able to realize that an incident of today may be an event of tomorrow. Reading the amenities of book collecting started me on a wonderful journey. The intriguing path upon which I took my first steps gradually widened into a pleasurable lane. In time, the lane resolved itself into an enchanting road, leading through fields of inspiration, wisdom, and knowledge. Along that highway, I met A. Edward Newton. Real friendship is not a matter of moments. Among other things, it takes passing time, personal association, harmonic response, community of interest, and mutual understanding to expand the candlelight of acquaintanceship into the bright and steady flame of true friendship. In the intimacy that I developed, I discovered A. Edward Newton to be a businessman and scholar, a rare combination. If more business and professional men could learn to love, know, and collect good books, they would find it a wonderfully broadening avocation. The three greatest teachers in life are men, books, and experience. My friend was kind and generous. As a source of inspiration, he was incomparable. Somewhat Pickwickian in appearance, he was the living personification of Ned Cheerbel. He possessed a personality that belies description. To paraphrase James Whitcomb Riley, he was just his self, Ed Newton, ne'er they ate no other one. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, Talent alone cannot make a writer. There must be a man behind the book, a personality. In referring to writers about rare books, Christopher Morley phrased a matchless expression when he stated that A. Edward Newton's works are printed personality. 
Mere ownership has extended that personality to every item in this great collection. It gives the books listed in the volumes of this catalogue a lasting colour and interest that are impossible to evaluate. These books and the man are linked inseparably. Treasured memories are mine of the hours spent with my beloved friend in his library at Oak Knoll. There, is, there, it was my in, there it was my inestimable privilege to, to examine and hold in reverent hands many of the treasures listed in this catalogue. There was Dr. Johnson looking down upon me from the magnificent portrait done by Sir Joshua Reynolds. It was my privilege to read the collection of the original manuscripts relating to the Dodd forgery. When I finished involuntarily, my eyes sought the portrait. The pathos and recognition in that unforgettable face made it perfectly clear that Dr. Johnson had done all that he could and had failed. As A. Edward doubted that Boswell had ever seen this collection, which includes a number of pieces in the handwriting of the immortal doctor, there should be some determined auction floor tilting among the knights who are collectors of Johnsonia. When the unknown knight raises his visor, he will have won a coronet of laurel. Unforgettable is the evening at Oak Knoll when A. Edward placed in my hands the original manuscript of Charles Lamb's Dream Children, remarking that it was the finest essay in the English language. When I finished reading it, I drew a deep breath. A. Edward looked up from his book and launched into a long discussion of Charles and Mary Lamb. Had I been a Boswell, I would have taken it down for posterity. Fortunate beyond words will be he into whose hands this manuscript falls. May they be loving and reverent hands. With it will come a part of A. Edward Newton. Another item that starts a train of memory is Leech's drawing of Scrooge's third visitor. An evening devoted to Charles Dickens naturally led to a discussion of the Christmas Carol, which A. Edward Newton declared was the greatest little book in the world. Who will argue with the point? It was a favorite of his, and he owned a pretty number of them. During the discussion, he placed Leech's drawing in my hands, remarking that he would pour ale from Dr. Johnson's teapot, which stood on a table nearby, if he could discover and acquire the original of Mr. Fezziwig's ball. During my last and never-to-be-forgotten visit with A. Edward, I referred to Scrooge's third visitor, the ghost of Christmas present, and expressed the opinion that Dickens' conception of the antique scabbard with no sword, the sheath eaten with rust, was certainly utopian as far as the world of today was concerned. He agreed heartily and remarked that he intended to mention it to Dickens when he met him in the great beyond. During the same visit, we agreed that despite the political messiahs of today, there are some things that can never be removed from the gold standard. Friendship and book love headed the list. To hear A. Edward Newton discuss his treasures was a liberal education, because he knew his books, knew their background, and knew their authors. Hours spent in the library at Oak Knoll taught me that Henry Churchill King knew whereof he spoke when he said that the deepest culture is not the culture of the schools. If more men realized this truth, it would be a better world. Machinery becomes obsolete. So do men unless they make constant additions of knowledge and ability to the mental plant. My last departure from Oak Knoll is indelibly engraved in memory. After an evening that led into the wee small hours of the morning, A. Edward insisted that I remain overnight. The next morning I took an eastbound train from Powley. As it passed his home, a rift appeared in the dull gray overhanging clouds. Through it, a glorious shaft of sunlight reached earthward and rested upon Oak Knoll as if in blessing. Involuntarily, I exclaimed, Amen. This introduction is more personal than biogra bibliographical, but I have spoken from my heart. A. Edward Newton was my friend. I owe him much. As Dr. Johnson wrote to Mrs. Thrale, I have indeed concealed nothing from you, nor do I ever expect to repent of having thus opened my heart. And that is the end of the introduction to the third volume.